as I said, I've been sharing from the beginning of the year about just the move of the Lord, and I have a real sense that um, already God is doing something. But um, I was wondering if I was going to share on it tonight, and I felt the Lord say, no, I want you to share on something else. And I was like, okay. So the title of this, if it's a preach, and we'll see how I do, is No Random Citizen. No Random Citizens, and this will make sense to you in a few moments, hopefully, but on Sunday, uh, last Sunday, I, I've been in isolation for nearly three months, about two and a half months, because MC had a transplant. My wife, for those of you that don't know, had a kidney transplant, uh, which is amazing. It's a new lease on life for us, but um, with the transplant, they knock your immune system so badly that you can't, if you catch any bug, it's deadly. So we have had to isolate as a family, which has been but like it was kind of weird for me because I'm not I don't have a kidney transplant I'm just felt like COVID all over again it was horrible stuck in my house I could surf in the morning and then the wind would blow and I'd be like hey what am I going to do now was, anyway so but um I, on Sunday was my first Sunday back and I didn't preach I just thought I just want to enjoy a meeting and I visited the new congregation that Dan's leading in Sunningdale AM the what's it was the 8 30 I think uh, and um I was in the worship and just enjoying the Lord. It's so nice to be back with the saints worshiping. And I looked across in worship and right at the far back corner were two men that I didn't know. And the church is getting so big. There's a lot of people that I feel I don't know. Although I'm quite good at faces and I, I hadn't seen these two men before. And I watched them in worship, but very much in the presence of God, watched them. Like almost like watching them from the Lord's vantage point. And I began to get overwhelmed um, with the Lord's love for them. But watching their faces and their, their responses to God in worship, I realized that they didn't really know Him that well, that they didn't really seem to understand His ways. And I began to feel quite wrecked. I began to feel like, uh, and the question came to me, who will love them? Who will draw them? Who will be His hands and feet? Who will be the one who will bring them through into growing and learning and becoming what they call to be, what he made them to be, which is sons of the living God. And that impression just stuck with me through the week. I ended up praying in my in a quiet time a couple of mornings, praying for them and just, Lord, who will love them? Who will who will draw them in? And um and the Lord kind of said, Well, you. You will draw them in. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Josh Jen has grown 42% in the last year. In other words, this year, a year ago, January, to now, we've grown 42%. That's an average per day of more than six people per day being added to Josh's generation. That's more than 100, it's 183 people a month. That's, like a, that's bigger than most churches being added in 30 days into us as a people and it is profound and it's wonderful and it's terrifying because that kind of growth is is challenging because we've got so much work to bring these almost like these huge catch of people into what it is to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ some of those people get saved in us some of those people are coming from other churches and to be honest it's harder when they come from other churches than when they get saved because when they get saved they like born again it's like a reboot like when I got born again, I knew I knew nothing and I needed to learn everything. So if you get born again into a healthy church, it's awesome because you just grow up thinking this is normal. But if you get born again into an unhealthy church, an unhealthy family, you are taught things that are not going to help you in the things of God. And you start to have an understanding of what you think Christianity is, of what it is to be called a Christian, a follower of Christ. And the problem is once that's set in us, we become so set in our way, so established, that even if you come into a church that is more healthy, you actually won't often make the shifts unless you realize how far away you are from what God got for you. And so we've got this incredible job. I mean, I, it'd be interesting. I, it, it, out of interest, who's joined Josh Chen in the last two years? Just stand. I'm quite interested to see actually how many are here tonight. A lot of the top, a lot of that side... It's awesome. It's awesome. So the challenge is this. I'm preaching and 
there's probably a lot of people tonight that did join in the last while that aren't here because they don't understand this. They don't see the value of this. Why should I go to a meeting across the other side of Cape Town when you've got guys coming? I mean, one of our young guys came to me. He, he was in a motorbike accident on the way here. And he arrived. His bike is still somewhere on the side of the road. He said, I can't, I can't close my eyes because I, I'm a little bit concussed. And I, and I, I don't want to, if I go to sleep, I might not wake up. And he said, tell them, tell them that. That somebody would go after that kind of thing and be here. Some have come from so far. And there's some that are right here. Just missed it. Just missed what the Lord would want to do. And that will happen more and more and more unless we are able to draw them through into what God's got for them. And so um, in, in this time with my family, we watched a movie. And I've been you've seen it before. It's actually a classic. It's, it's uh, called Megamind. Megamind. And it, there was a scene in the movie that just, uh, I saw the scene, we had a good laugh. And then I woke up when I was, just the Lord gave me this preach. And that scene was flashing in my dream. Like I woke up and, and I knew I had to play it because it's a, it's a picture of Megamind, for those that haven't seen the movie, which you should see it, is, uh, it, it is this evil guy that actually ends up becoming good in the end because he's just got a bad childhood, basically. Sucky laugh. But there's a superhero, like Superman kind of hero in the movie. And so it's kind of good and bad. And eventually, you know, the bad becomes the good. But the, the hero is this, like, it's called, um, I'm going to taste the name again, M Metro Man. And he's this, like, Superman, good-looking, muscular, like, you know, and, and white, he's got this white thing. And he's just like the superhero, like this can't do anything wrong, he's perfect. And then Megamind is this loser bad guy that eventually you know becomes good but at one point metropolis the city they live in wants to honor um Met metro man because he's such an amazing hero and they just love him so much and so there's a scene where they they make a museum they dedicate a museum to him it's all about him and he receives this you know we uh, thank you so much that you've put a mu made a museum for me and he's got this little speech and watching the speech i thought this is so much of what so much what people think Christianity is and so much of what it is in some circles. We've got the superstar pastor, the super mega, you know, guy that comes out in a puff of smoke kind of thing. And and um and 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 he's this like superhero and everyone is just you know ooing and aahing about him. And at one point he starts this long speech about how honored he is and uh like kiss his feet and you know he walks on water basically and he's like you know, my whole purpose in life is to protect you helpless people of Metropolis. And it's really what I'm here for. And thank you for the honor of this museum. And then at one point, right near the end of the scene, someone shouts out to him, We love you, Metro Man. And he, you'll see right at the end, he kind of flashes now and he turns back and he says, And I love you too, random citizen. And it's this classic scene of this, like, you know, superhero, and, and, and everyone thinks he loves them and knows them, but actually, he's kind of probably into himself than anything else. And, like, we love you, Metro Man, and I love, we, I love you too, random citizen. And I'm just watching that thought, so often that's what the church is. People come, and there's a superstar guy up front, a man of God, come and get the power, come and get the anointing. But there's nothing of that, you know, and it is, you're just a random citizen. He wouldn't care if you were there next week, as long as his numbers are up. You're not known as an individual. You're not known as someone who actually will get to know you and to walk you through into all that Christ has for you. And so church has become a thing that you go to. You're a random citizen, and you're going to go to the place where, you know, Metro Man or some other awesome man is up there or some other awesome woman is up there doing their thing, and you can just enjoy the show. And churches are built across this nation like that. That's not the church that Jesus is looking for. That's not at all what he's looking for. If you're going to grow in a church like that, you'll go to courses. Courses aren't bad in themselves. But Jesus didn't design us to go to seminary and courses. He designed us to come into something called family and as, a, as a community of faith that we would be known and loved. So no random citizens is something that I would love us to carry into this year because for me, the church is not about, you know, we're, I think Josh Jen is over six and a half thousand now. But it's not six and a half thousand. It's Russ. It's Mark. Dan. Charles. 
It's individuals. It's individuals. And until we see it as individuals, each one loved by God, they'll never fully learn and reflect what God is looking for. I love the Bible because it's full of individuals. It's full of Jesus, you know, it's awesome. And, and then it's Zacchaeus in a tree. It's a woman with an issue of blood. It's blind Bartimaeus. It's, it's his individuals that he stops everything for and loves them. And, and people are changed because he finds them as individuals and draws them into community with himself. But not just himself. He wants to draw people into community with his body, which is the church, the expression of him on the earth. And I love what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 12 to 14. It says this, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, listen to this, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Your father, our father, does not want one of us to be lost. His son, Jesus, died to save us. And so church, when we do gather, it is, it is about the one. It is about finding the one and loving the one. If you come to a meeting and you just think it's about, you know, going to get the word and get a little bit of worship and then go home, you've missed the whole point of what it is to be members of his body. And we're to love. We're to love the one. We to find that, 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 that there's, no in, there's no random strangers in the church. I remember, um, you know, we have these jokes about in the old days when we were in the Pentecostal days, we used to call everyone brother or sister because we just didn't know their name. So, you, you know, I pray for my brother, Lord. I pray for my sister because you just don't. And I don't think that's what it's supposed to be. In fact, Josh Jen, the reason why it's, I don't know how many congregations it is now. It's probably 40, I don't know, probably moving near 50 congregations is because, is because we don't want to create a place that you can hide. We don't want to lose one. We don't want one of you to lose your inheritance. We don't want one of you to just think that you're a random citizen. Because each one of you are loved by God. Each one of you are important to God. Each one of you have something that the Father wants to give you. And we have this duty, this job, this thing to do to bring you through into what he has for us. Uh, Ozzy, I met you just tonight. Where are, are you here? I did say I might call you up. Where are you? Is that him there? So I'm, I'm sitting, and Ozzy doesn't know what I was going to preach, and he came up to me just randomly and started speaking. I met him tonight. Um, he just, as you know, Josh Jen is not about me. I'm just one of many elders, and you're in different congregations like I was looking after you. But come up, and uh, he came and told me this little story tonight, and I just thought it epitomizes what... The church is supposed to be. So it's how he got saved. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Sally. Um, so um, some of you know me. All of you do not know me. But I would like to meet all of you at least one day. So, um, yeah. In 2019, I joined a, a rock band, and um, it was a great time. I lived a life of gentle debauchery. Every weekend was out just unsanctioned degenerate. That's the easiest way to put it. And for the longest time, I felt it felt like um, like there was nothing there. You know, it was like it was soulless. You know. And uh, I tried to find something, you know, to fill my life. Um, you know, you could read Nietzsche till you blew in the face. You could read Thomas Aquinas till the cows come home. But all of the scholasticism doesn't amount to something that's weighty and me, meaty. So I used to live around the corner in William Street. And um, most of you guys, at least once a year, would park outside my gate. And um, yeah, thanks for that. And I used to go to the gym across the road with the Virgin Active, and I used to walk across and I'm like, what are all these white people doing in Pado? You know? And it just didn't make sense to me because you'd be all walking around on your phones and it's like, guys, 
it's a dangerous area. And so, um, so I, I walked through the parking lot and one of the car got stopped me. He's like, Hey, but, um, you know, what are you doing tonight? You should uh, come to the service. I'm like, Oh, uh, should I pay? Like, well, how does it work? I was like, no, just, just come. Don't worry about it. It's the final day of the conference. And you know, people are just, you know, worshiping God and you should come. And I was like, yeah, whatever, dude. Sure. This group of girls walked past me and be like, hell this. I was like, I'll consider it. So I went, uh, I went home and, uh, I was like, oh, well, I've got nothing to do when the little studies is done. And, um, I was like, okay, well, I'll give it a chance. So I walked in and as I walk in, there's no space. Everyone is in the corridors and like, what, what is this? Because in the churches that I come, people just sit in their own corners. So I had to, you know, mosey on up to the, um, what do you call this thing? The balcony and, um, and, uh, try and find a spot. Halfway through the service, I leave to go to the toilet and I come back and someone is sitting in my spot. Like, and so, um, so, uh, we have a laugh about it and, uh, it starts to get dark and then, um, I decided, okay, well, I'd like to walk home now because I don't want to be mugged. And so I jump down and start walking. But as I'm walking down, I hear the footsteps like thundering down the stairwell at the back. And as I get to the, to the foyer, he's, this guy uh, turns me around, his name is AJ. And then he's like, uh, you know, I just feel God is telling me to invite you to church. And I'm like, and so, um, we exchange numbers and, um, I ghost him for like a couple of weeks after he messages me. He messages me a few times and he's like, uh, Mervis is coming to Durbanville, Stellenberg. Um, you should, you should come. And I'm like, oh, well, no, oh, okay, sure. Whatever. So I go to the service and people just start greeting me like it's like, what? Why? I'd like, who am I? Just give me my coffee. Let me sit down at the back, you know, just leave me alone. And so, and so I go there and, um, it's, it's, um, altar call. And so, um, I was not of the opinion that I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I was just going there to see, okay, what is this all about? You know, I guess these are nice people, you know, very rich and I don't know. Anyway, we'll see what happens. And so, um, so he comes up to me and he's like, Oh, well, you know, I just feel the Lord is telling me, I'm like, dude, no, it's not going to happen. So he pushes me to the front and then, um, and then Russell starts to pray for me. And then all of the elders in the Dermal congregation, like, well, they're like speaking in tongues. I'm like, <sighs> anyway, so at the end of the service, they all sit on me like, okay, they baptized. I'm like, no, okay. We're going to get you baptized. You're in a congregation. They come I'm like, no, okay. We're going to get you in a comp. And then going down this checklist of things that I've got to do. And I'm like, didn't ask for any of this so i didn't come to church for a couple of weeks and they put me they put me in uh cindy and emil uh the ruse come and i was like okay fine i'll go they got a nice house maybe they you know have nice food but the one thing that always stood out for me was they have a red door beautiful red door and every time i went through that door it felt like okay there's something special you know and then um i didn't get it at first like if you saw me back then my hair was here I wore a leather jacket everywhere and jeans tighter than this because in the, in the rock and roll world, things are, it, it is how it, how it looks. Um, it's not fulfilling in any way from a spiritual perspective. It kind of breaks you down to an extent. And so, um, I found that, uh, over time I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I, didn't, I knew what I was doing there. And, uh, there was a guy, his name is Hugo. Uh, Eunice and he's one time at the com he said to me like after sharing my, my, my life story and he said you have a father and he loves you and my father was hardly there for me um, he was in and out of my life in certain regards and I was like well, what does this mean and eventually um, after coming on and off the com still having long hair and things like that I, I, I spoke to my elder um, my leader, com leader and he said and I said to him I feel something's wrong. Like, I feel like, I feel like weird. Right. And he said to me, it's because you're still a visitor. And this has been like six months down the line. You're still a visitor. You need to make a choice. And I didn't want to live incongruently to my actions because that's like the recipe for destruction. And so it was then that I decided, okay, I'm going to make a choice. And this choice is going to be an, a grown up adult choice. Because one day you have to grow up. One day you have to make a stand in what you believe in and if you're praying for someone if you have like someone in you like you planted a seed in someone years ago or whatever don't give up on that person look at me i was sitting there five years ago Thanks, man. <laughs> that, that, that. 
I love that story. Somebody saw him leave, ran off there. Somebody saw him in a meeting and, and one by one, people just found him. And he went from random citizen to member of the family. And it's a story that actually is a story for most of us. I remember myself. I come out of a, also a Pentecostal church. I did you know, Bible school. I did prayer meetings. I did two meetings on a Sunday. But I didn't know the people. I didn't know the family. And then we visited a church in Port Elizabeth called New Covenant Ministries International, or New Covenant Church. And Julie Dalau, oh, she, yeah, I know she's been a bit sick. I don't know if she's here. Julie Dalau, are you? Stand up. Stand up, Jules. She's my PA now, but... We walked in, and the first thing that struck me about this church was, these people know each other. And there was a, there was a deep sense of community. Single mom, Aiden was... Four years old, three years old, his son was three years old, single mom. Husband had left there. I've come in, long hair, looked like that rock star, with my wife. And a single mom with a three year old son invites us to her home. Do you know that that had never happened to me in four years of Christianity? I went to her home and she, I often say, she didn't have a lot of money, but she knew how to make rice taste really good. And I started meeting people and, 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 and people started praying together just spontaneously at home. And I was like, I've never seen this kind of Christianity. I, I wonder how much of Josh Jen was forged and fashioned in Judy's Lounge. Because somebody loved us. And she really did love us. I mean, and others like it. That just drew us into family. And I realized for the first time, churches... Church is actually closer than family. Church is this place where, you know, my blood is close, but actually this is eternal. This is closer than even that. And I was changed by that. And I, and I feel like for Josh Jen, that thing can never get lost to us because it is the heart of what God says the church is supposed to be. And I love that, you know, in Acts, where is it now? In Acts 2, 46 to 47, you, you, you know, people go to meetings, but it's not just meetings. It's homes. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple court. So we do have meeting. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So you get the feeling there that this is a sense of, this is not like even there's a, a community night. It's just people loved each other enough to hang out and to enjoy Jesus together. It's not like Sunday and Wednesday. It's come into my world, come into my life, come into who we are as a family. And when that happens in the church, that's where we start to reflect him really well. I love Psalm 68 verse 6. I love what the King James says. It says this, God sets the solitary in family. God sets the solitary in family. The point of the church is family. And here's the thing. We've got guys coming every Sunday to our meeting, but are they coming into our family? Are they learning through our love, what it is to belong to the community of faith. And we've got a lot of work to do because you're talking thousands of people in the last year that have joined and they've got to be processed through. And the best way to do that is, yes, courses are great and you know, community nights are great and Sundays are great, but they get processed through more in homes than they will anywhere else. Is that you, Nev? Oh, it's so stoked you still. Yeah, I actually wanted to contact you. Lucky to see you. Nev, Nev leads our congregation in... Uh, Zimbabwe. Amazing story. I wish I could let you tell it just how uh, he came down here and what the Lord did in him and how he went up because the Lord told him to. Yeah. Anyway, so the family and uh, in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11, you know, the apostle Paul writes and he speaks to the church and he says, we welcomed you into our hearts. Church isn't this meeting. It's not just meetings. It's welcoming people into your heart which means can i say this sometimes your heart's going to get hurt then but that's okay because it's family it's messy but so i feel like for us uh, we have to continually look to build for the one and uh, again there was a, a a tv program when i grew up which is a long time ago uh, the older guys remember cheers and, and cheers was this pub I think it was somewhere in America. And uh, what the guys would do is the whole TV program basically orientated around people arriving at the pub after their work or after wherever it was. And, and basically you watch their life. It was in those days, there wasn't much to watch. So you watch, you know, you watch the TV room. But, but there was a 
the theme song was so powerful and it and it kind of spoke about why people go to pubs why they went to pubs and why and, and you want to be where everybody knows your name now look at a church this size we break up into smaller congregations because it's too big for everyone to know your name but there is that sense that in this family this community this everyone knows me and i'm known by everyone else and the cool thing is we actually get to know each other beyond those communications too and we end up with friends all over the world through 412 and our children grow up with you know with friends all over the world because we are part of a bigger family and so again we we want to always be building around the one and i really want to ask us going into this year that we take the time to draw people into family and yeah, that means doing stuff with them going on weekends loving them uh loving them because god loves them and because he's brought them across our paths you've got aussies coming through our meetings and it's going to be as we draw them in that they become part of the family and contributing members of God's household. And, and I want to say this, we need to do this all the time. And I would ask us, always build for the one. And we, when I arrive at a meeting, this is what I always do. And when I arrive at your congregations, I, I walk in and I watch. And you can normally see a visitor because they, they normally actually arrive early, funny enough. Like Josh Jenner's arrive late, but visitors come early. And, 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 and we should arrive early because that's we know. And, and you can see they walk in and you, they don't know anyone. So they kind of get a little bulletin and they go sit down in a corner somewhere and they act like they're filling it in because they don't know what else to do. And the, the terrible thing for me is we can't just have Josh Jenner's going, hey, bruh, and enjoying each other up front because actually we bring, God sets the, 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 the isolated into family. And so we've got to be reaching out and drawing people in. So look, on Sunday, you'll be amazed at how many Aussies there are in our worlds. And if we just love them, you could be a part of that person one day, really becoming a child of God and a contributing member of the family. I think the other thing is this. You've got to know that in a church, your worst should be also known. I know we put on our church bases. Like when you go out on a date, let's be honest. It's a lot of makeup, a lot of hair. Even the guys are doing hair now. It's, it's just, and, and, and part of it is because you want to put your best foot forward. You want people to like, you want this person to like you. But I think in the church, we actually should, we should actually want, especially our leaders, to, to see our not so good sides. Because it's, it's, you know, it's our not, our not so good sides that are causing us to get in trouble. It's our not so good sides that are killing the life of Christ in us. It's the not so good sides of us that are stopping us walking in what God's got for us. I don't know what it's like to try and hide those things because I did too. And again, talking about Melani and Julie. So we could come into this community and Melani ended up, she was a missionary, but she ended up visiting a lot and we would hang out and, and they got to see MC and I in our early days of marriage. And, and, and it did. I, I'll tell you what now. I, I came into a place where I, people knew us. And so MC and I, in our early days, I've been married now 29 years. But our first two years were like hell on earth. And I remember fighting with her and, and arguing and shouting. And I even once sent her out of the house and, and, and locked the sliding door, the gate. It wasn't there was a gate to go. And she said, well, give me the car keys. So I remember getting the keys and throwing them at her. And she took the keys and bailed. And do you know where she would go to? Family. And I'd get Julie phoning me a little bit later. Come pick up your wife. No, I don't want to. Grow up. Come around and pick up your wife. You've got to love her. And, 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 and these guys, I remember when Lonnie literally said this. She was b- burst into tears the one day when she saw how bad our marriage was and said this. <laughs> you really have no idea of what marriage is. And she's never got married to this day. <laughs> I'm the cause. But you know what we found in that community? We found we were, we were, we, we were terrible. And I, I, I was so scared that if people knew how bad our marriage was. I'd never walk in what God called me to. I knew I was called. But I, I realized this. I needed people to see these things so that I could fix them. Because... I can't fool God. And I've got to learn to be a better husband and I need help to do that. And so I found in that community, people loved me enough to see me as I was and to actually love me through that. And I feel like for us as a church, I want to ask you, don't hide your weak areas. Don't hide your weak areas. 
You should want the leaders to see him. In fact, the Bible actually says this quickly. Let me find the In Acts 20, 28, listen to this. People are like, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Uh, uh, this translation, I think, I think that's NIV. I don't know what this is. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Pay careful attention. Don't you want someone paying careful attention to, over you? But you know what that means, eh? It means they're looking over your shoulder. And they're not looking over your shoulder to catch you out. No, oh, you see, you're a sinner. Out you go. No, they're looking over your shoulder to love you and to help you. To bring you through as one of God's precious sheep into all that God's got for you. And so we actually, here's the thing. It's the things that you're hiding that are stopping you walking what God's got for you. It's, a, it's your weak areas. It's the areas that you haven't got victory in. And you see, all of us need help to come through into what God's got for us, which means we need honest conversations. We need people that love us enough and know us enough to actually say, hey, you need to work on that. And, and that's got to be part of what we are because we know each other. You know each other because you don't just see each other on Sunday and Wednesday when you've got your Bible face on. There's a clip I wanted to show. Could you put that little clip on that little sheep clip? This is, this is us. <laughs> Is a shepherd pulling you out? You got yourself in a big hole. <laughs> it's a story of the church. It's, you just get out and you get back in again. <laughs> it, it, it's such a picture for us. And you know what? It's okay. We... we we love each other through that and we keep working to bring people through so that they do break free from their cycles that put them back into those holes and cause them to lose the love of God. And so again, in your marriage, in your finances, in your relationships, in your thoughts, in your beliefs, you can need to let people in. And we need, to, we need to take the time to love people enough to actually get to know them so that we can help them get out of the hole. And stop being the sheep that God's called them to be. Uh, one of the things that uh, we had a, we've got two Canadians here now, which is super cool. It's just uh, we are there sitting over there somewhere, wonderful, just coming from a church in Canada. But we just had a whole crew of Americans as well. And in, they were with us at the elders camp. And one of the I Americans asked me at one of the sessions afterwards, he said, can I speak to you? I'm struggling. So uh, why are you struggling? What's, what's tripping you up? He said, I'm tripping up with how open you guys are. It says, you just talk about each other's sin in front of everyone. Like, like one of our elders had gone through an issue, and I just got up in front of all the elders and said, this guy's struggling with this area in his life. And, and, and it was just so open. And he said, how do you do that? Isn't that slander and gossip? I said, no, it's not slander and gossip. Gossip and slander is to tear down and to, do you know? This is actually to help the person through. And I said, do you know in the Bible, we Bible people, right? Yes. Tell me this. What happened to Simon Peter? When Paul rebuked him in his letter to the Galatians. Do you realize Simon Peter messed up 2,000 years ago? What happened? There's a bunch of Jews. So a bunch of Gentiles is enjoying bacon. Because thank God for Jesus, we can eat bacon. And the Jews arrive. And they're coming with all their pedigree and their robes. And so Peter gets intimidated. The Bible says fear of man. And he shrinks back. Even Barnabas gets led astray. Because they're all a bit scared of these kind of staunch Jews. And Paul rebukes him in front of everyone and then writes a letter for the whole world. So that 2,000 years later, I know exactly that Peter was a hypocrite in that meeting. Do you know that doesn't change a thing about the fact that he was still the man that Jesus built his church? What is about Abraham? Father of the faith. I was telling the elders this. Abraham, the father of all who believe. Abraham believed God and God accredited him as righteousness. Abraham goes to Egypt, the man of faith, and thinks, my wife's quite a babe. These guys are going to kill me if they realize that she's my wife because they're going to want to. So, so he lies, the father of our faith, lies because he's got no faith in God and says she's my sister. He does it twice. God, the Bible says this. What's, what's done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops on that last day. 
There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. I just figured we just get over that stuff now. We, you know, when my video plays, I hope you guys are going, oh, yo, we knew that about him. It's not like, what? He was that? Because we're people of the light. As we live in the light, as he's in the light, we have true fellowship. And the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sin. If you want to grow, get into the light. If you want to grow, start opening yourself up. Shouting in the hole, don't do I'm not actually in the hole, it's just my legs sticking out, but I'm not actually. And then I want to say this too. We, 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 we I mean, guys, the elders are moving around. Do you know why these elders are moving around? Because we want to take care of every single individual. But you know what? As hard as we try, we're going to fail. You will at some point in your life go, nobody lives in this too. And I think God will even set you up for that. Because ultimately your source has got to be him, not us. And so I feel like, give the guys grace. They're working hard. And not all perfect, nor you. But God uses this mess of us. And he does amazing things through us. If we just keep giving ourselves, if we keep coming back, if we keep pouring our lives out. I can tell you this, I don't know personally of another church in the world with elders that I was committed. I, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm not saying that... Before God, I say that. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know? How, do you know? How, we've got how many elders? 200. And 200. There's about 30 of you to one of us. You know why we've got so many elders? And we've got deacons that help. And home group leaders. Because you are precious to God. And we want to give a good account. Does that mean we're going to get it right always? No, but we are working as hard and fast as we can. To get that right, so give us a break, be a good sheep, and just come through in love. Because if you keep, you just, just keep coming, keep coming. And and there was a yeah, I don't have time to see all these prophetic pictures, but there was such there's such a sense of if you just keep on keeping on, you'll eventually find your breakthrough into what God's got for you. So, and then I, I want to say this: one of the challenges is we've got to actually take people. And Matthew 28 says in verse 19, make disciples, make disciples. Yeah, you know, the word disciple, according to um, the concise dictionary of words in the Greek Testament and the Hebrew Bible, is this. It's matateo, it literally means this, to enroll someone as a scholar, to enroll someone as a scholar, to, uh, to be a disciple, to instruct and to teach. But think of that word, to enroll someone as a scholar. Jesus said, go and enroll people. Bring them into family and enroll them as scholars in my house. Teach them about everything I've taught you. To be enrolled isn't just a voluntary, it's, a, it's not an organic thing. You know, you either enroll at a place or you don't. You can visit a school, but enrolling at a school means that you become you join, you know, I'm in this to learn, I'm in this to grow, I'm in this. And so there is a real sense for us that the only way this thing works is if you are totally given to it. And I loved what um, Ozzy said. He kind of came around and wasn't really, like he was kind of like there but not there. And then the guy said, you need to commit. You need to commit. You're either going to enroll or you're not. You can't do the sort of. You can't half-hearted. You're either in or you're out at some point. You can flirt for a while, you can date for a while, but at some point you've got to go, I'm in or I'm out. And if you get in, you'll find you come in to all that God's got for you. And so we've got a lot of people that want to, I guarantee you, that want to come to Josh because it's a cool church. We're actually teaching, our teaching's not that bad anymore. Our worship's quite good, actually. Our teaching's actually quite good. There's a lot of pretty girls. There's lots of reasons why people come. Hey, Ozzy. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Shit. Uh, I forgot where I was going. I was like, I'd lost an Aussie. Now, where was I going? <laughs> we, need to, we need to bring people into what God's got for them. And that means we have to work hard at helping them understand, hey, we want to love you into family. And then in family, we want to have these conversations where we say, hey, Aussie, you, 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 you're flirting with us. You're never going to benefit unless you give yourself. And this thing of giving is in the Bible. Um, and I love this, and I'll finish with, I'll finish with the scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 15. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Do you know Acts 2, 42, the church starts in Jerusalem, and it's 
They devoted themselves to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay. This is the first Gentile convert in Achaia. It's quite interesting. Listen to what happens when they got saved. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. These are Gentile converts. Jews get saved. Devotion is one of the first things you see. And they have, Gentiles get saved, devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to you know, follow them and do likewise. So, devotion, devotion. We have to help people understand that you can't just come slowly, slowly, but they can't just hang around in the background. They actually have to become enrolled members, join together in Christ. It's like when Jesus said to somebody, Charles, follow me and Charles went I will follow you you're my teacher and at this point I'm following you he became a disciple likewise we are to make disciples which means we've actually got to take people on a journey from brokenness from that little sheep in that in that hole to the place that they actually are beautiful and walking in all that God's got for them I wonder how many how many worship leaders how many drummers, how many guitars, how many people can usher people in prison, but how many servants, how many leaders, elders, deacons, how many people? I know this, Jesus said, I make disciples of nations. And I know this, that we're growing fast, but the world's going to hell. And we've got a lot of work to do, even with what the Lord is bringing to us every single week. And so I want to call you, if you are a visitor, and you've been coming around, think carefully about what I'm saying. You'll only benefit once you give yourself. But if you're also a part of Josh Jen, remember this. Better to give than to get God set the lonely in, or the isolated in, family. Would you be, would you be a Jew leader? You have no idea. Well, will you be that guy that runs down and invites, you be that person because as you do for the least little ones of mine, Jesus said, you did it for me. And I think as we love, as we get this right, that there's no random citizens, but that actually people are genuinely loved. People are known by name. We know them, and we love them, and we're working with them to see them mature in Christ. So then we can be the church that looks like he wants the church to look. I'm going to ask you in closing, maybe close our eyes, bow your heads. Firstly, I want to speak to those that are maybe newish. You know, have you devoted yourself? Have you given yourself like the household of Stephanus or like the early church? Have you understood that the church, it's through the church, the Bible says, that God's chosen to reveal his glory to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. It's through this thing here called family that you will grow and mature, break out of the cycles in your life and come through into all God's got for you. It is a process. But it starts with an enrolling, a giving of yourself and saying, I'm in and I'm going to follow. I'm going to work this thing through. And I want to invite you to do that. Uh, there's no other way for you to walk in what God's got for you than this. This is the only way. This is the way God's chosen it to work. But if you will yield and humble yourself before the Lord, He is faithful and willing and will bring you through, break you out of your patterns, out of your cycles. And bring you through into all God's got for you. I know some out there, some of you are listening and hearing me and you like you've been hurt, been let down. Listen, that's family. But if God's bringing you here, you need to work these things through. You can't draw back. You can't isolate yourself. You need to come through. So I want to pray for you in a moment if that's you. And I also want to pray for those that are members of the family. And I want to remind you, no random citizen. And I want to call you to become one that will find the Aussies and find the Andrews and the MCs and, and that you will love them and bring them through into your family, that you'll draw them into community and that you'll love them with Christ's love. Yes, we've got courses. Yes, we've got meetings. But the church is orientated around home. It's orientated around family. And God sets the isolated in family. Would you be the kind of family that God can bring an individual to and they'll move from a random citizen into a royal son and daughter. And if that is you, both of those two groups, I want to, I want to pray with you. 
And that should be in all of you, to be honest. So if that's you and you're saying, yeah, Lord, I'm in, would you stand with me? And I just want to pray with us. One of those two groups. You're saying, I'm going to jump in or I'm in and I'm going to start reaching out to draw people in. You have no idea how your life will impact others. I, I learned, I learned about homes through a single mom with a three-year-old boy that had no money. I learned that. I fell in love with the church. Be truly, man. Father, we, we know you love us so much. And you're drawing us, Lord, into so much more because you're a good father. For each of us here tonight, Lord, there is a sense that you want us to be contributing members of your house, contributing members of your family. You want us to love and to draw people through into more. But likewise, Lord, some of us here have been on the outskirts looking in. We, we've come with a different mindset. We haven't understood your ways. But tonight, and as we've been hanging around, we're starting to see there is a better way, your way. And we want to embrace it. And so if you know all of this, group, just, would you just respond? Just open your heart to the Lord. Lord, for those that are on the outskirts, would you draw them in? And I want to ask you if you are on the outskirts, even if you've been in with us for four or five years, but your heart is just pulled back. I want to ask you to give again, to devote yourself again, to become a pupil, an enrolled student, to be a disciple. To come through and to start to open up your weak areas, your bad areas, your broken areas, so that your brothers and sisters can love you and shepherd you and bring you through. And then, Father, also for all here tonight who you call to bring people into family. Father, would you make our homes places of your presence? That lost people would come and enjoy sweet fellowship with Jesus around our tables. That, Lord, as we gather together, as we meet with them, it wouldn't just be on Sundays and Wednesdays, but that we would draw the isolated into family. That we would love them through, through their brokenness, through their bristling, through their rebellion, through all those things that make up what it is to be human. Until we see them, Lord, come through and break through and finally break free. Father, you have so much for us as sons and daughters. I pray that as a family, as a community of faith, we will reflect you well in this area and that we would see foreigners coming through into family and we'd see family loving the one and drawing them through from random citizen into family member. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to get this right up. Amen. Go be it, man. Go do it. I, I, I'm convinced that when we get to the end of our lives, for those that have served, don't sit down, I'm finished. You guys, are, well, don't laugh like that. <laughs> I'm convinced we'll be blown away at just by loving the one. We'll be blown away at how the Lord is blessed with our sacrifice. It's going to be that as we make disciples of nations. Music